going to share from um, Forsyth, P.T. Forsyth, Peter is his first name, hardly known by anyone, <clears throat> even out of his own congregational church in which he was a minister and a teacher, died in 1921. So his principal work took place at the turn of the century. I have one book where a series of lectures that he gave to Yale Divinity students on preaching. There's another book that's an old-time classic called The Soul of Prayer that should be in every believer's bookcase and in their hand. I've never read anything more powerful and more penetrating, more profound on the subject of prayer than P.T. Forsyth's The Soul of Prayer. And somewhere in the course of that book, he says that the whole purpose of our faith and our being is prayer. That the soul of prayer is the soul of the faith, not just an adjunct. So he's a remarkable resource that I bumped into almost accidentally, a little classic called The Cruciality of the Cross. Very cross-oriented and probably one of the most original thinkers that I've had the privilege to um, encounter. But his language is often difficult, and he's, uh, he's wrestling with static concepts and formed and hard doctrinal things like the two natures of Jesus that go all the way back to the 5th century determination of the councils of the church of how to understand how deity and humanity could be reconciled, and that uh, they laid the foundation for the church's present understanding which is rather fixed and static. But here comes a man who wrestles and comes up with a way of perceiving the remarkable issue of, of uh, incarnation in a way that just blows your mind. So you'll have to listen closely. What is considered his most significant work is the book that I have in my hand, The Person and Place of Jesus Christ. And there's a publisher now in Oregon who has reissued most of uh, Forsyth's works, so you don't have to go scrounging for some uh, used copy. You can get them freshly printed, and it will stretch you. Um, if we had all kinds of time, I wish you know, we could go through ma many chapters of the book, but we have, in the shortness of our time, just to deal with the last chapter or so. So, Lord... Um, if there's such a thing as asking for special grace, though grace itself is special, we're asking for a special special <laughs> or a grace of graces that we should uh, be able to obtain from this remarkable saint, something, my God, of the riches of his own wrestling and, and uh, coming through with a perception of the mystery of, of Christ his person and his place of incarnation, the unprecedented event that has taken place in time and history <clears throat> of God coming down into the earth and taking upon himself the form of a man and that there are implications for that union of deity and humanity that go even beyond the atonement affected by it, that there's other things that should be understood because we bear something of that mystery in ourselves, God in our flesh. So, uh, Lord, make this rich and uh, prompt such responses and questions as will forward uh, the deeper understanding. Yes. And as I just prayed in my little walk, that you'll give answer to the distress and the cries that came out from this morning in a way and beyond what they could have thought would have been appropriate. In the same way that you gave Nicodemus an answer that utterly perplexed him, that did not seem to have any correspondence to the questions that he asked. He asked from an earthly plane, and you answered from the heavenly. So today also, answer from the heavenly plane, and in so answering, bring us up to that plane. We thank and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It should be remembered that human personality is not a ready-made thing, but it has to grow by moral exercise. 
One of the things that distinguishes the writings of P.T. Forsyth is the word moral. It comes up almost on every page. And it's a word that has become extinct in our contemporary life. Whoever speaks about moral, what does moral mean? It's like an echo out of the past that doesn't have any present cogency. And yet, as I have said, and in a message that I gave in Albania, that someone graciously transcribed, the issue of what is moral is the issue of what is man. Script man of what is moral, and you have an animal. It, it is the thing that is moral that distinguishes the humanity of man. So I quite understand his frequency in the use of that word. Because before, uh, just a line above where I began to quote, we have man's movement to God and man's action on God, either in the way of aspiration and prayer, or in the way of acquiring from God moral personality. Can you see why I drool? Moral personality. Like, wow. All we knew before was personality. And in Brooklyn, poisonality. <laughs> but moral personality. That, that what is the component that really distinguishes what is human as personality is at its heart the moral component that there's a moral personality. And if Jesus is anything, he's that. Jesus was a moral personality. Not moralistic. That's the difference. That's false piety. Like the length of your skirts and how are you dressed and blah, 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 blah. No. That's moralism. That's, that's religious contrivance. Moral is a much deeper word. And you don't wear it on your sleeve. It's intrinsic. It's in your deeps. It's what you are. It's the distinguishing mark of your humanity. But if we're not conscious of it, and we overlook the occasions by which moral personality is formed or grows, how shall we attain it? If we're just a bunch of dum-dums, and one day is like another, and we never see an issue or a crisis in its moral meaning, how then shall we obtain that meaning? And most of us don't see it. So, it should be remembered that human personality is not a ready-made thing. You could say, I, I can't help it. This is, uh, I inherited this from my parents. I grew up in Brooklyn. I can't help it. But you can't help it. And uh, there are issues that come before us, usually as crisis, that require some response that has to come out of our deeps that is more than the issue of practicality or expedience, but the issue more of rightness. What is right in, in a case like this where you don't have a book to which you can turn and find a prescription, but you have to find it in that moment in the measure of the knowledge of God that you have and the union with him. There's, there's where the moral personality is formed. And that's where this writer says Jesus' moral personality was formed. He did not come full-blown. He grew in grace and stature by facing these issues and responding. So it has to grow by moral exercise and chiefly in the kingdom of God by prayer. The living soul has to grow into moral personality. So here's prayer invoked as the milieu, the mode by which the moral things are of, obtained. How do you know what to say and do? Well, you turn to the Most High, the soul of prayer, not just your formal time before coming out for the day, but in a certain sense, you're continually breathing prayers Godward, as I just did now, taking a little walk for how to, how to commence here. What, brought, what he brought with him was such a soul as was bound morally to grow under his life's vocation to the personality that was the complete and final revelation of God. Isn't that a remarkable thing that the Father would trust that something has had to be worked out in the career and history of Jesus in his own personality as a human being, as a man, and the issues that would be before him by which in his history of moral responses he would grow into the form of the Son of God that reflects the Father. That this is not some fixed thing that is ironclad, but there's a dynamic here, even of the Father's trust.
talk about faith and the sun in which there's a moment by moment and an event by event dynamic of life and reality in which something is formed over a history that by the end of that history what you have is the expression of the Father perfectly. Got the, what a difference this view is than to think that it's all canned, all mechanical, and all given. This shows the issue of faith, the issue of prayer, the issue of relationship, the issue of autonomy, the issue of being a human being faced with crises that require decision. Hey, that means he at every point, point he was like as we. That's how he became a high priest. If it came all fixed and in a capsule and it was all determined before he left heaven to come to earth, where, where's the, what, what does his earthly tenure mean? Just providing a body that can be put up on the cross? We, we have not sufficiently considered the remarkable, the magnitude, the, the, I don't have a word for it, the adjectives fail, of what is represented in this in, incarnation that is not fixed, but that there's an element, a great element of reality being propounded by episodes given by the Father and in the reality of being in the world by which a moral man grows in stature and grace in dependency of the Father. That is an example for us and a pattern. He's the pattern son. And this gives us a greater glimpse of what sonship means. It's not going to be any mechanical for us, a ready-made thing, if it was not that for him. We will grow morally by the issues that we face in which we're, we turn to, the, to God. And so he had to grow under his life's vocation to the personality that was co the complete and final revelation of God, the agent of man's redemption. If he hadn't grown to that, what he had sacrificed on the cross would not have been sufficient. He had to complete the true man and true God to be true sacrifice. So this is not some light question of his getting it together. It's more than the issue of how it pertained to him. It's the issue of how it pertains to us, how it pertains to the Father. He had to come to a certain formation that fulfilled his vocation or his destiny, but he didn't come to it mechanically nor automatically. He came to it in a life existential dynamic of responding as a man without the access to his deity, which he had laid aside th those prerogatives, and had to work out before the Father uh, in response and in speakings the kinds of things that he did. So by the time that the cross came, he was the complete son. That's, that's what Forsyth is saying. Well, where does it say that? It doesn't say that. We're, we're given only the sparsest biblical information, but it requires a Holy Ghost immersion into the mystery to seek out what this incarnation means and represents. And I don't know of anyone who has probed it more deeply than this man. And I appreciate the um, reform writers and uh, John Murray, but they are so exacting, they are so precise, they, are, they haven't moved a bit from the Nicene Council and the Chalcedon. All they're doing is expressing the classic uh, theological doctrinal view of the issue of, div of uh, divinity and humanity but it's not an insight into the mystery it's just a reiteration of the, the conclusions to which the church councils had come in order to avoid threatening heresies to the faith so they just gave the bare skeleton praise God for it what this man is doing is coming in deeply into it, trying to understand what that mystery represents so a soul of Godhead is the necessary postulate of the redeemed personality, the redeeming personality. It's the necessary foundation for the growth of that personality. It is the necessary condition of the finality of his work. Now, is that so, Mr. Forsyth? Then what's the necessary condition for the finality of our work? Dum, da, dum, dum. I I'm teaching you guys how to read. <laughs> Yesterday was how to examine a text today is how to read which is to say when the writer is making certain statements we need to ask as we're reading well then what's the implication for me because certainly there's got to be an implication 
So what is he saying? That um, the agent of man's redemption, the soul of Godhead, was the necessary foundation to the growth of that personality, and it is the necessary condition of the finality of his work. That the issue of his personality and the formation of his humanity and manhood is not just some isolated subject in itself, how interesting, but the necessary condition for his redemptive call, for his vocation. He had to be true man and true God to be the true sacrifice. And if he, if he missed it and did not come to a fullness, it would, been, would have been inadequate. Well then, what about us and our vocation? What about our calling? What about the things that make for our finality and our completion? Is it altogether unrelated to his, or is it altogether profoundly related? Therefore, he should be himself an object of study. Because in studying how he attained to the fullness of his manhood in the light of his vocation and calling has got to give us some insight in the things that are intrinsic to our call. We're not getting fancy to be fancy, but when you probe the deeps of the faith, it, it is going to require a stretching and a hearing and uh, uh, dealing with words. So it was a personality that differed from all others by finding its growth to lie in the unaided and sinless appropriation of that which it already was. What are you saying? He's finding and attaining by a process of growth that which he already was. He was already the Son of God. There's no taking that away. He was, it, he was that eternally with the Father before he came to earth. But now coming to earth in his humanity, and by process of the life of his humanity, he's finding out or becoming what he already was. Well, what were we already who knew us from our mother's wombs? There's a mystery even to man, as if God already foreknew us as if we had some kind of an existence or he foresaw that uh, there's a knowledge <clears throat> that we've become what we already were or intended to be. You have that sense? Like you can pray for st strange men like myself who think that what they are about in God whether in whatever nation or situation is a work to walk in that was established before the foundations of the earth were laid. And not just some impromptu uh, happenstance to which we have to kind of find our way by the grace of God. We're walking in works established before the foundations of the earth were laid. So there's a certain pre-knowledge of God in the mystery of our call. And mystery is not a bad word, dear saints. The, the American church is conspicuously lacking in an appreciation for mystery. I'm not talking about detective stories. I'm talking about those things that lie too deep for words, that need to be in, intu, intuited or apprehended yeah. if we are to have a commendable sense of God and ourselves in his purpose. There's mystery. And when you have a sense of mystery, you'll find yourself so much less prone to becoming exasperated or impatient or how come and why. You just let, let those questions. There's something being worked beyond your ability to know what to understand and that it's God's work but that he had to do it and that it's not automatic that it requires prayerful <coughs> decisions and exacerbating crises that, that tear your heart out and that you feel the moral weight of it and the moral anguish of it he's the pattern son but astonishingly we are called in great measure to that same pattern He's, he's working out something for us, and we need to follow that pattern, so emulate that pattern, so I recognize that it was not a snap for him, that he had no advantage unavailable to us. Even in the miracles that he performed were available to him through the measure of his faith as they are available to us. See, it's one thing to have a phony, synthetic... Um, Emulation of Jesus, like, well, he's an object of admiration. What can you say? He's God. He, of course he had the power. He had the ability. We, we can't hope to uh, emulate, you know, be like that, but we can admire him. 
There's much more here than, than, than just admiring. There's a pattern here that we need to observe that will encourage us to, in the attainment of our sonship and the fulfillment of our vocation by the same means by which he obtained it. That's the point. But if he's God, then he couldn't help himself and always had the right word and the right act and there was no moral groaning attention of faith, then all we can do is admire him, but we can't be benefited by him. See what I mean? He's the ultimate son. This is the pattern son. You want to know what sonship is? Study him. And if, it did, if he did not obtain it through what he learned in obedience through suffering, how then did he obtain it? And if it took a suffering of obedience for him to obtain it, what will it take for us? Well, that will give us a different attitude about suffering. And not just physical, because the more excruciating form of suffering is moral. Of the kind of cry that we heard this morning. I wonder, uh, in that sense, that the statement that he made, greater things than I have done, you will do. And was, th if this mystery needs now at the end of the age to come into a full and corporate son that merges and takes in the diversity of personalities and, and all the things that make up for our individuality, that's a greater work than what was attained in his own individual sonship. The, in, in, the inherent mystery is there in him, but to see that now come to full expression in a body is awesome, and that is the ultimate glory of God. Unto him be glory in the church that, uh, that has come to maturity as sons and can act with the same obedience to the Father as one life with one voice and in the same moment as he exercised in his own individual person. What an achievement. Amen. I was ready to throw in the towel after this morning, just hearing the different ones in their condition. Like, wow, who, who wants to be locked up in, in Noah's Ark with a bunch like that? You'd go out of your skull. But this is it. That's what we're here for. That's what we're in. So I, Ben Israel has been a suffering. The church is a suffering before it's a glory. And in it, you have to deal with the, the saints in their diverse condition, circumstance, maturity, understanding, and out of their own hurts and the unique histories of their own lives, failed marriages, betrayal, some warp has come by which a woman is now nursing a grievance that is ventilated by gossip. And so you, you don't just deal with the surface thing, but you seek for the root. She's got to be healed or if she's going to be part of this composite glory for which God waits and nature and creation is groaning until now for the manifestation of the sons of God in fact we should say the manifestation of the son of God that plural composite entity that Chris is talking about but the genius of it was already set forth by, by Jesus but this is a greater work that this can come in a in a um, composite corporate way and what does that take it's not just that we are required he himself is trusting in fact his faith and his trust is far more staggering than our own easier for us to trust in God than for him to trust who has put all his eggs in one basket called the body of Christ or his own son on the earth and all of the temptations and struggles through which that life would pass and the father trusts because as I said yesterday faith is the milieu faith is the divine environment in which God himself moves and has his being it's not something he requires of us it's something that is intrinsic to him so it's a, a remarkable thing that the father in every way is afflicted with our afflictions as he was with his son he knows the struggle he, uh, he's not detached I don't know how to explain it. We're, 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 we're at the threshold of revelation or heresy. And I'm not sure which way we're going to fall. <laughs> but if you don't take that risk, you're going to forfeit the revelation. This is what Forsyth is saying. He, was, he came to this by a progress of growth that when it was complete, he was that image. Maybe at any stage he reflected it, but the totality came with the completion of his growth. And the same issue is with us. But the father trusted for that, and the son did not betray that trust. But it required a dependency on the grace given by the father. And we equally 
have that dependency. All I can give is my own little paltry experience. That is to say, does he tell you what that work is? Do you know it in advance? So you have to trust that when you open your mouth, what is being expressed is that is the fulfillment of that work. After it's finished, you can see maybe something of the magnitude of what has taken place. But the beginning and the continuation is the issue of faith and trust. So th there's a tension. Because it's, it was established before the foundation that the earth was laid, doesn't mean that for you it's going to be a snap. For you, it's a total risk. For you, it's a threat. For you, everything is hanging on the making or the breaking of it only as it comes forth in moral obedience. Got the idea? And when it does come forth, it is that work. It requires a faith to believe for that. But it doesn't mean that faith means you lean on your haunches and it's, it's all done and you just come and open your mouth and boom, it takes place. There's, there's a dynamic of trust, even word for word. Have you ever watched speakers like that? They stop and you wonder what they're pausing for. What they're pausing for is the next word, the next thought. They don't have it except as they are giving themselves in faith for the unfolding of it, as we are doing even now, right now, this morning, today. That I looked at this book two days ago, put it on the pile, and now I'm opening it for the first time. Why? Not to say, look, man, no hands, but to give God full optimum occasion to give on the spot his spontaneous work and by the life of his spirit. True preaching is that every single time. True teaching, true witness, true prayer. There's got to be a, a living God. Isn't that who you're playing, praying to and whom you believe? He's a living God. Okay, Lord, you're on. This is it. This is finale. This is conclusion. We can't humanly know what needs to be expressed in the last session, having heard the cries of this morning. People still in distress, still waiting for answers, still more agitated for having come than had they remained. So, Lord, how is that to be met? And one final statement from you at the conclusion of our days. Who is sufficient for those things? And so you open and you trust for the dynamic of God himself in his presence in the reality of his spirit and power to bring forth. And when he brings it forth, it's the work that was appointed and established before the foundations. You know what? If that's true, what kind of admiration ought we to have for such a God? That a work that was established in his conception before the foundations is now being perpetrated, obtained, and performed in this gasp of stuttering and, <clears throat> and believing and gasping for air and for the word uh, in all of the moral strain and trust that hinges upon a piece of flesh called a man for, the, for that work. So it brings the thing established with the thing taking place in its present dynamic. Well, maybe I'm still uh, a, a Marxist in my deeps because the root of Marxism is dialectical materialism for anybody who's been to Sociology 1A. What is that? That Marx drew from the German philosopher Hegel, who had conceived of a, of a uh, dynamic at the root of life called dialectical, a dialectic of a thesis and an antithesis, something in opposition and something in the working of these opposites and the dynamic brings forth the new thing. Synthesis. A synthesis. And what is a synthesis? Socialism. What does it come out of? Capitalism, and I don't know what else. And so Marx took this philosophy and brought it as a key of history and the understanding of society that was so dynamic that it, it, it raptured me. When I was a kid going to Marxist Institute in Manhattan, I can't tell you, I, I, I would leave the, the, the lectures floating. I was, my feet were not on the floor. Dialectical materialism. That it so spoke to my heart because it touched at something that I think is real. Isn't it interesting that uh, Marxism and communism has done more in its perverted way with the concept of the community and the cell and people in a bonding of uh, identity for purposes that the church itself knows. So 
that this man is bringing this kind of mentality. There's a dynamic. We haven't seen it sufficiently, and that's why we're so passive. That's why our churches are constituted by overacting men on a platform, the professionals, and ministering to a sea of passivity. That nothing is ever required but their presence and their dollar in the collection plate and an amen and a hallelujah and the singing of a chorus. We're, re- we're breeding an entire church that is stupefied and in stupefaction and narrowness and does not grow because there's nothing required. There's no dynamic. There's nothing incumbent upon them. It all takes place from the platform. So we lose the genius of the dynamic of the church that Jesus exhibited in the dynamic of his own humanity. That's what this man is saying. Okay. We, we need to become dialecticians. We need to see, to see the uh, spontaneous and uh, electric elements that come up in life that need to be recognized and to see the outworking that things are not static and fixed there's hope there's there's the presence of God who is the third fold, third fold cord in covenant his presence in our situations means that our marriage is not hopeless if God is the third fold there's hope unspeakable and there's a dynamic there of how he will express that presence and how we recognize it and yield to it and, and are tempted in our condemnation of, of each other for failing as husbands and wives. So it's another mentality. And would to God the church would have it. I would say faith is sacrifice in every instance. That is to say, you can easily lapse into your own humanity in any situation. It's always accessible to have a convenient, practical answer out of your experience or out of your knowledge of thought if you want to be relieved from the tension of what God's word and God's reality is in that moment. So the faith means the sacrifice of forsaking the comfort and security of what's available to you in your unaided humanity. And then trusting that what comes is from God and speaking and doing it. So there's only one of multitudes of instances where God will do the untoward thing and often in a way that seems to contradict what you think God to do and even contradict and offend your own taste and sensibility that would offend you to hear anyone say it let alone that you should say it <clears throat> that's the faith which is sacrifice that's the faith that Jesus exercised I only do that which I hear from my father or see from my father I never once drew from my own very capable humanity as distinguished as it was. I was ever and always totally thrust upon him. I'm a son. And my uh, my object is not to get by in the moment that I'm saved from embarrassment. My object is to glorify and gratify him. So whenever he gives me to speak, Nicodemus comes and says, and who's Nicodemus? He's a ruler of the Jews. What a plum! What a feather in anyone's cap that if you gave him a step one and step two and how to be saved, brother, and, and, he, and he receives the Lord and he comes into the congregation and he's a, 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 an important person in the Jewish community. Whew. Terrific. What does Jesus do? He blows it. He confuses and he bewilders the man and gives him answers that seem totally unrelated to his questions. Except, the, except you be born again. Of the spirit and water, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. God wasn't even thinking along those lines. Must I, must I pass again the second time through my mother's womb? Shows how literal and material he was in his mindset, though he was a ruler of the Jews. Which means he should have been informed about spiritual things. Jesus said, if you'll not receive from me these things, how shall I receive heavenly things? So he's giving him a heavenly answer to earthly questions. And letting the man go in a bewildered state in which you don't know the result. Because he himself says in John 3 that the, the spirit blows where it will. And you cannot tell from whence it's coming or where it's going. But we want to tell. We need to know. That's what we were schooled in the world. You don't do something before you know what the consequence is going to be. But in the kingdom, the spirit will list where it will. And you cannot know where it came from, know where it's going. You cannot know. All you can do is be obedient and yield it to that spirit. That's what Jesus was. And what do we find out in his death? 
Nicodemus is the one who asks for his body. And if Nicodemus is not in heaven now, I'll eat this book. (laughs) And he's in heaven because he received an answer from the Father, greater than his question, to a son who is obedient to give it and not fall back on John 3.16 or are you saved, brother? See what I mean? Faith is a dynamic of trust. And it will bring you into places where you find yourself mortified or embarrassed or, or you think that even the, God himself is being contradicted. How can he say that and do that? And yet it is God. And you need, and you need to trust. And how do you come to that faith? By suffering. Yeah. By degrees. By a history. You grow into it. He's not going to give you a challenge of faith beyond what your present capacity is to which he has led you now. You're not going to be asked to address 60 university students or 100 or 200 black ministers. You're going to be asked to witness to the next door neighbor or to your Jewish dentist or something like that. The, 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 the issue of faith will be appropriate to what our history has been till that time. And when you're obedient in that moment, then you go on to the next, the next, and the next. So it's, it's a dynamic life, not static. Okay. In fact, to use Jesus' reply to Nicodemus for yourself may be entirely to miss the Lord. He didn't give us a one-time prescription for every situation. Now, because he said that to Nicodemus, now we have a formula. Life is not a formula. That word that was perfect for Nicodemus would be totally out of place with another man on another occasion. So what we need to do is find the word appropriate for the man in that moment and in that situation as Jesus found it for Nicodemus by a trust of the Father. That's a dynamic life. So the great question that Saul asked when he was brought down to the earth on the road to Damascus is the question. And Paul lived his entire apostolic life in the light of that question. Lord, what would you have for me to do? So we need continually to be in the tension of of that question now every day like today is this what the Lord would have us to do or should we have done something else because once it's done it's irretrievable and that, that heightens the, the, the risk and the value can we have a confidence in that what we are about is what we ought to do how valid is the question that we're putting forward do we really mean it and if, uh, and if it requires something on our part like embarrassment humiliation or the prospect of failure will we yet obey it's not, it's not pat, it's not snap. And as far as Jesus knowing his vocation, even that may have been progressively revealed to him as he went on. As he came closer to the approach of his death, he, he was able to say, I need to go to Jerusalem in their wicked hands and I'll rise. Right. But maybe he didn't know it at the first. And the angels therefore had to comfort him. And uh, So we need, this is what it means True man and true God. True man in trembling. True man in dependency. True man in faith. And all of the kinds of things that we face as men. It was a personality that differed from all others by finding its growth to lie in the unaided and sinless appropriation of that which it already was. But it was in no faded or mechanical way. The ground of his inability to sin did not lie in the immunity of an almost necessity of a nature or a rank, but in the moral details, the moral reverberation of his great initial and inclusive act, eternal in the heavens. His renunciations on earth had behind them all the power of that compendious renunciation by which he came to the earth. Isn't that a stagger? Is that a, a thought? The great renunciation was the decision to come to the earth That's why the crisis was not just his death, but his birth. The voluntary willing agreement of the son to the father to leave the indescribable blessing and comfort of eternal presence with the father and come leave that and come into the earth was the great renunciation. It was already the cross before the cross. It was already the principle which is intrinsic in the Godhead itself. And once you have that behind you, that initial moral resolve and decision and choice, then your earthly walk is the continuing working out of that initial renunciation. I'll give an A for the day and two gold stars if someone can translate that statement into its application for us now.
Dum -da -dum -dum. That there's a single basic great renunciation that is foundational to the entire subsequent spiritual life and the fulfillment of its vocation. But if it is not made, then how shall our continuing renunciations have an energy and a source if we have not made the initial one that Jesus made before he came to the earth? What, what's the what's, what possible application of that for us? Do we make a decision before? We're in the earth now. But have you ever made a once and for all basic renunciation? Dum -da -dum -dum. A really a, a committing of your life to, the, to death that you have no life, no possibility, no future if there's no resurrection, that there's no purpose for you in and of yourself. And you're giving over your future and your hope for marriage, for family, for career as one dead. That your baptism was that renunciation. And if there's anything after that, it's the miracle of resurrection or you're still down there in the water in the muck. How many have made a renunciation of that magnitude? And I'm su suggesting that because we have not made it, most of us, our lives are continually spotty, up and down, erratic, one day up, one day depressed, because there was not as foundational a renunciation at the inception of our spiritual life as there was for his. I've never before seen that. I've never before said that until I'm reading what he's saying about Jesus. Because my practical Jewish mind, or whatever it is, is always looking for what's the implication for us? And there is an implication. There was a profound renunciation for Jesus before he left heaven. And every subsequent renunciation, even to the cross, was, so to speak, already decided there. Once you've made that, the rest follows. But if you've not made that, you're going to be choking and spluttering and kicking and, and howling all the rest of the way. Let's, let's examine the genius of that apostolic moment. Because Paul is the uh, apostolic man. That begins with a revelation, the sight of the crucified Christ, uh, the, ac the indictment, why do you persecute me? And then, Lord, um, what would you have for me to do? When does God answer that question? He does. And by whom? And when? Ananias. It came through Ananias, who was one of the lowliest and most ordinary of all saints, trembling with fear to go... To, to this uh, dangerous man's bedside, lay hands upon him. But when he does, the answer is, tell him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Not what deeds, what great things he must suffer for my name's sake is the essential answer of God to the apostolic man. What's the implication for us? If Paul is the prototype, the paradigm of of, of apostolicity and this raises the great question and this is the great answer what then for us who have apostolic intention not to be apostles but to grow in and serve in that mode and that reality there's a great suffering have you recognized that do you even have a heart for great things do you have a heart for the word great because to be called to what is apostolic is to be called to what is great and necessarily implies a great suffering. Okay. It was so for Jesus, it was so for Paul, and it, it should be also for us. But in no faded or mechanical way. His renunciations had behind them all the power of that compendious renunciation by which he came to earth. Have we recognized that as compendious? I don't know. I've never heard that word before. An enormous renunciation. It's the revelation of God. Just the decision to come shows God's own nature and the Son's freedom and voluntary choosing to obey the Father's will is the revelation of God himself even before he comes on earth. Just the voluntary decision heightens our appreciation. And that's why elsewhere in this book he says in the previous chapter in which he, a whole chapter is devoted to the pre-incarnate life of Christ he says, the church is suffering. I've got to find that for you. It's so true. It may be observed in conclusion on examining the pre-incarnate life that, if, that the, if the influence on the church upon the world is less today than it once was, that loss of effect 
is at least concurrent with an unprecedented weakening of belief within the church itself in his life before life and in his prenatal will. He's saying the church has paid a price for losing or perhaps never having a sense of the pre-incarnate life of Christ. That there's mystery there. There's revelation there. And to ignore that is as much as to ignore the post-resurrection life, namely his ascension. So the coming down into the earth is a profound statement of God as the much as being raised up out from the grave to the throne is a statement of God. If you miss the one or the other, or give them inadequate attention and comprehension, you miss God in the fullness of his glory that is intended for our perception and our praise, our worship, and our adoration. We may be losing out on the issue of adoration exactly to the degree that we have been non compass on the pre-incarnate life and un have not understood what it represents and what it represents in Jesus' voluntary willingness to leave it, to come down into this grimy earth and suffer not just the physical things but the moral things of God being compressed into the finiteness of man and suffering all those things as a servant and then as a death of the most vile kind as a criminal. So the same author is saying it could be that the church has lost its influence in the world and that it's concurrent or in proportion to the weakening of belief within the church in itself in his life before life. We must consider the pre-incarnate life because something was transacted there foundationally that is later acted out in the earth but had its first inception in heaven. Because he made it, he can communicate to us something of the moral strength tested in his own decision for us to make a comparable decision. See what I mean? This, this is the legacy of the humanity of Jesus that we acquire by faith. That in him is the, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but also all the fullness of his own history, of his own renunciation. He's the master renouncer all the way to the cross. And he's calling us to a renunciation also, not just once, but continually. Like not speaking a conventional thing that would please people, but a thing that will stupefy them, or whatever it is the obedience requires, is predicated on a certain grace given to us by someone who has already preceded us in it and can communicate something of the moral strength necessary for us to perform it. So without him, we can do nothing. We can't even renounce. And maybe that's why our renouncing is so threadbare, because we've, we're renouncing out from our own humanity. We're making a human kind of decision like, I don't know, as if it's a commercial transaction. Why do we do that? Because we have not understood the magnitude of what ren renunciation is. If we understood that, that it's some measure of what he renounced, giving up his eternal union with the Father, coming into a grim and inhospitable earth in a world that is at enmity with God, and that our renunciation bears something of that same weight, we would know that we can't make it humanly. In fact, we can't do anything humanly. We are utterly dependent upon him who has gone before us. And you know what? What an appreciation. What a, what a deepened admiration that he's not left us orphans and he's not left us destitute, that we don't have to play the game of, of Christianity as Rotarians and Elks and as if it's some fraternal organization and we can do this by the numbers humanly. The call to the faith is impossible. With man it's impossible. God has called us to what is impossible, but if it becomes for you possible, you're out of the faith. If your Christianity is something that you can perform on the basis of your humanity, your resolution, your ability, you're out of the faith. We can become servants, which is the essential identity of God himself. Of course, servanthood is renunciation. And um, we should not be ashamed of a lowly calling which Jesus demonstrated in the washing of the feet of the disciples, not just as a momentary inspiration, 
but as a statement of what he ever and always was even before his earthly advent that the father himself is a servant how is he a servant? he sends his son he sends now everything every good and perfect thing comes down from above the father is continually serving the son served we're called to serve but we want to be served rather than to serve so um, we will reflect our greater David not just uh, as a model that we emulate but as a life that we have received that's already conditioned and disposed to those things by his nature so he's working out his essential nature in the eventualities of the life on earth he had come to a place of humiliation humility in which his supposed knowledge has gone out the window with that revelation of the crucified one whose believers he was going out of his way to persecute so what he has to say in one fell swoop I'm all wrong everything in which I've trusted and I've been groomed is totally wrong I don't even know God I'm opposing and persecuting him in my zeal Lord who are you and uh, I think that that is a necessary preliminary to the question of Lord what would you have me to do that we're co-heirs with him if we will suffer with him so also will we share his glory that what Jesus exemplified in his life Paul experiences and now commends to those whom he brings to the faith and yet is that note current with us that suffering is intrinsic to the faith is unavoidable and not only as persecution or external suffering but where that's not available there's an inward kind that the Lord knows how to allow even in the ordinary circumstances of our life our marriage our family and our situation that is even yet more painful and more excruciating than that which is external okay well so even as his earthly acts of individual forgiveness before he came to the universal forgiveness of Calvary had behind them the cross which he took up when the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world his relation to God was immediate from the first and perfect but that did not give him any immunity from the moral law that we must earn by which we earn our greatest legacies let me re read that his relation to God was immediate from the first and perfect as the son in his eternal designation with the father in heaven before he came but in coming that did not give him any immunity from the moral law by which we must earn our greatest legacies I even wrote it any magical immunity his deity did not make him immune or save him from the requirement of being a man in the world and testing and perfecting the reality of his sonship to the father by the, by the things which he suffered and had to experience because he lay aside those prerogatives so we must earn our greatest legacies and appropriate by toil and conflict our best gifts here he's not waiting for us to ask the question he's telling us if this is what Jesus had to do how do you obtain your legacy and your best gifts in the same way by the moral law conflict and all that is required in the attainment of maturity this was only possible if he had to begin with a unique central and powerful relationship relation to the being of God apart from his own earthly decisions so that his growth was growth in what he was and not simply by what he might be it was not acquiring what he had not but appropriating and realizing what he had it was coming to his own unique self so he's saying very much about that relationship with the father a unique central and powerful relation to the being of God so question is did Jesus have that by virtue of his eternal relatedness to the father or did he have it by a faith that appropriated and quickened the relationship with the father was the father a factor in the Lord's life automatically by virtue of his prehistory or was his, the father a factor in his life by his continual prayer and devotion and the seeking of the father early at the commencement of every day <laughs> you understand what I'm asking is even the relationship with the father a moral issue and not some automatic thing that with which he came fitted by his prehistory 
though it was true he had that relationship with the father's prehistory but to eventuate and activate that knowledge and relationship with the father on the earth it was not by summoning what he already had automatically it was by devotion it was rising early in the morning it was seeking the father it was condescending to the father it was waiting on the father that makes all the difference because then that relationship is equally as available to us we equally need a sense of the father behind us as sons and if we couldn't have it by virtue of natural birth or circumstance already in the earth we can have it by an attainment through prayer through fellowship through communion which is in fact the critical factor that is so grossly neglected by most of the church today because we are unwilling like Jesus to rise early to seek him he was not seeking him for instruction I know that I know that he was seeking him for communion that's why he said this kind cometh not out but by fasting and prayer not that it will equip you with a formula it will equip you with a reality uh, of God and his magnitude and majesty and authority that is so implicit in you by your union with him in devotion that when you address those dark spirits they know it Jesus they know and Paul they know and they know you because you exhibit the same inward reality that you have attained by a process of devotion over a course of time that's why this is so important to ferret out whereas the church somehow assumes in its unthinkingness Jesus had it all together you know he came he was the son of God that that then he did this and he did that well what do you expect of course but if we understand that his struggle and the moral issues of his life are exactly identical to our own and that there's a process of growth through faith and obedience that required a dependency and a trust and a knowledge of the father that grows by virtue of his devotion is not automatic that changes the whole complexion of things that gives us a deeper appreciation for the son a deeper appreciation for the father that the father lets the son go like like the father of the prodigal son not to waste his substance but to let him go and all of the risks that coming into the world will be because the first thing that Satan that Jesus has to experience after the baptism in in the Jordan where the dove came down and the heavens was opened and the voice of the father cried out this is my beloved son is being driven into the wilderness and tempted by Satan if you be the son of God then make stones into bread if you be the son of God do this if you be the son of God he's already mocking and questioning the very statement from the father that he is the son of God and Jesus can say well listen he's got to wrestle out these temptations after fasting 40 days and making giving the answers to one who's brilliant in his own knowledge of scripture so there's an immediate testing as soon as the issue of sonship is struck which is already a crisis for Jesus don't think because when he finished what happens the angels come and they comfort him there's a solace this it was such a trial a test of his nude identity before the most dangerous opponent that it required the comfort of angels to be given him after it and that's how his career commences this is this is loaded you know you can almost come to love a, a Lord like this who went through all that for our sake not just with the atonement great as that is or we be dead ducks but also to teach us what it means to be sons and to go before us uh, uh, by in the realm of faith that we can believe for ourselves by the same grace he didn't have to he could have come automatic could have performed the things necessary for atonement taken up back to where he came from the glory that uh, was always his he went through a history a life as a man and even as a child when he was with the doctors of the law in Jerusalem both hearing and answering questions hearing and raising questions is a precious glimpse of his humanity though he had a brilliant I'm sure by even at the age of 12 sense of things in his humanity he, he respected these older men he respected the sages he respected these doctors of the law and he both uh, he, uh, raised questions it wasn't to tempt them or to mock them but to be engaged with them in his humanity and then the parents come because he had disappeared 
and they were vexed. With, Don't you know you've, you've upset your father and me? He said, Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Don't you understand? You don't have just an ordinary son here. I have a, I'm, I'm getting to sense that I have a destiny to call in my father's house. And then he, it says, he went down with them to Nazareth, so, and he submitted to them, and the next verse says, and he grew in stature and grace before God and before men. His going down was the key to his growth. Coming down from heaven was the key to his growth. Going down to Nazareth was the key to his growth. What then is the key to our growth? Dum, da, dum, dum. Going down to Nazareth, submitting again to conditions that are not conducive to our spirituality, but actually oppose them. Well, what do we have in our American mentality? Discipleship school. Three months. Uh, go ahead and save the world. Young upstarts who... Because we're seeing the older upstarts in such great need. What can we say about the young upstarts? So we, we think we can knock something off the assembly line and send out green and ill-formed young people who don't yet have a history in God, don't even know what devotion is. And faith for them is a formula. You believe for this and you call for that. They don't understand faith is an apprehension of the character of God that you know through a history with him in trial. He, he sweated clots of blood in the anguish of this final thing that completes his course. If you get avoid it, not because he was a coward or he could not take physical uh, punishment as severe as it, as it would be, but to become sin in so ugly and noxious a way that the father himself had to turn his face and depart from him in any felt sense that he would have to cry out in ultimate despair, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what he, that's the cup that he hesitated to drink. That I would have to forfeit the sense of my father? I've known it eternally. It's my life. My union with him, my sense of him is my life. And even for a moment, that that has to be taken, that, that this is what the cross is, not only it's physical, but it's moral anguish. I've got to drink that to the dregs. If this cup could pass, but of course it, it could not. So I'm fond of saying that the blood of, a, of atonement in its first expression was not extricated by man, but exuded by the Son of Man in the garden. He sweated clots of blood. I mean, so, so deep was the moral anguish of facing that cross in all of its agony, morally as well as physically, that we need to bow before this, this remarkable sacrifice. And that's why that sacrifice was a sweet savor to the Father. This is, this is more than the blood of calves and bulls. This is the perfected Son of God. This is true man and true God, giving himself voluntarily to the most vile form of execution that only satanic ingenuity could conceive through a Roman system. And he knew that in sense when he left heaven that this would be the ultimate destiny. And he did it voluntarily and freely because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and God so loved the world that his only son was willing to be given. So that's the heart of the faith and the gospel that Paul says is the righteousness of God from faith to faith as it is written. Okay.